Okay, to those who hear us, we have the final speaker today, final lecture. It is, uh, the talk will be delivered by, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, Luis Gomez, again from the Institute for Theoretical Biology at Humboldt University. And he will give us a talk about informational spread enhanced by criticality in high responsive groups of fish. So, Luis, please go ahead. You have one hour. Uh, one hour. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, also, first to the organizers for yeah like giving me this opportunity to present you our work um, on 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 criticality in, in animal groups. Um, and I'm a, uh, quickly. I'm a, I would say I'm a postdoc working with uh, Pavel Romanchuk uh, here in Humboldt. Um, and yeah, today we'll uh, we'll present you our work on. Um, how biologically, biological collectives or biological groups of individuals uh, process information, um, specifically in the context on, on, on how the surroundings um, can influence uh, the dynamics and the shape of this group, as, for example, some questions uh, were, were asked in previous talks as well regarding these topics on, on, on how these fluctuations affect right, the, 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 the dynamics of the system. An example of animal groups that are heavily affected by uh, environmental cues um, or the surroundings can be found in nature um, quite often. Uh, in some of them, the external influence might be, for example, of geometrical nature, for example, confinement um, in, in, this, in the case, for example, of, of groups of sheep, um, but also the presence of predators, as has been discussed in, in previous talks as well, um, um, has an impact, right, because they attack uh, the, the groups of fish, for example. Um, this can have a huge impact on how the group moves and might uh, require uh, an adaptation of the individuals to face this threat. Um, and the system I will talk to you about today uh, enters precisely in this category. Um, we wanted to quantify the influence of, again, external input or external inflammation um, flow, flowing to the system on the dynamics uh, of the group of individuals. Uh, for this purpose, we studied a system of uh, small fish uh, called sulfur mollies that you can see here on the, on the top left, uh, bottom, bottom left of my slide. Um, these small fish live in sulfuric waters in the southeast of Mexico. As you can see here, uh, there is like a sulfuric, sulfuric stream and they live in these waters. Uh, these individuals, these fish, are adapted to tolerate the toxic hydrogen sulfate within the water, uh, which gives them some advantages, um, like, for example, feeding on biofilms of sulfuric water, um, sulfuric bacteria, sorry. Um, but also they don't have any foraging competition, and there is also absence of aquatic predators. So they benefit of this, um, given the adaptation they have. Uh, but the price to pay is that they are forced to stay uh, very close to the surface of the water most of the time to, re to, to breathe, to get, uh, to get oxygen. And let me show this video, and I, it will probably stop. Okay, so this is stopping, and I expected that, so I will show the video here, right? So this is the video I want to show. Um, and this video was taken from inside the water. And what, what you can immediately notice um, is uh, how individuals stay very, very close to the surface most of the time, right, um, to have access to this oxygen. Um, this makes the dynamics um, of the system almost uh, a 2D dynamics, although it's not really 2D because they can still uh, dive into the water, right? However, as you can see in this video, there are this collective and highly synchronized dives that occur uh, where individuals spend short times on the water, right? So let me stop again this video and let's go back to the presentation. So this is a snapshot, right, of the video you just saw, where um, in this case the individuals are diving. However, the fact that individuals are forced to stay close to the surface attracts many different bird species um, that act as opportunistic predators. They attack the fish by diving into the water, as you can see in these videos here. Um, and as a reaction to the attacks, uh, the group of fish exhibits a particular type of scrape response um, 
that we saw inside in the video on the taking on the water, which are this synchronized timing. This behavior propagates via social interaction through the population, leading to large scale waves that can be traced uh, from the outside of the pond. A key observation in this system is the existence of waves even in the absence of the attacks. As you can see in this video here, where, where you have this emerge, uh, the, so the, 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 the waves they emerge uh, even uh, when there, there is no attack. Um, this is evidence of the fluctuation dominating nature of this system, and it's precisely, precisely this spontaneous emergence of these synchronous waves that we will call baseline activity, what we will study here in this talk. Um, and notice that the uh, um, diving behavior can be traced from the outside of the water, even by eye, uh, due to the water splash that individuals they produce when they dive. This is going to play an important role here. Um, um, after all these biological considerations I explained to you and having them in mind, uh, we focus our efforts in studying the dynamics um, and wave propagation of the baseline activity of the system. Um, let me define very precisely what we will, what we call baseline activity. And it is, um, I, I will use the scheme here that yeah, you are seeing, and it consists of temporal intervals where no evident perturbation from the, from the surroundings was observed. Um, but still some collective diving occur, which can be recognized by us, okay? Uh, in this scheme, um, I use uh, the label bird attacks to refer to these evident perturbations that we, can, that we excluded from our analysis. Um, and it's, I, did the, I used the label uh, bird attack because it is precisely the bird attacks that are the most frequent perturbation to the system, which we can see by eye, right? Um, in this sense, the study, um, or we study, um, those intervals, time intervals, where the surface waves emerge spontaneously, and as you have seen, uh, oh sorry, as you, uh, as you saw in the small videos I, I was uh, showing in the bottom. To quantify the dynamics of the system, we analyze recordings of the baseline activity and produce the videos, uh, sorry, process the videos to uh, obtain these black and white frames here on the, on the, on the right, uh, where white pixels represent uh, the positions on the surface of the water where individuals are diving. The processing of the videos is done in two steps, a first one where we rectify the videos, and the second one where we convert the color pixels to black and white pixels. But let me first quickly explain how the rectifying process uh, works. And it was done bef um, well, before each recording session. Uh, we put a one by one meter wide plastic square floating on the, on the surface of the water. Um, and then we track the positions of the four corners uh, of the square, as you can see here on the, on the left. And using these positions of the corners and some computer vision algorithms involving projective geometry, we can then obtain the matrix that transforms the original polygon to a perfect square, as you can see here on the right. Um, in this way, we can transform the videos to have a top view of the water. So this is the first rectification process. And now let me quickly explain how we obtain the black and white pixels, uh, or black and white videos. Um, we processed uh, the, the, the videos um, by using um, uh, the uh, background subtraction process. And what it does, it, uh, it, it, is, it is, um, computes or calculates the changes in the RGB values of an uh, original video in RGB. And then it declare a pixel as active if the change was larger than a given threshold. Um, all active uh, pixels are uh, white colored and, uh, and all non-active pixels are black colored. And the videos you saw here are the results of this process. It is important to stress that the white pixels in the process videos represent just the positions on the surface of the pond where individuals or subsets of individuals perform collective dives. Okay? So at the end of the day, what do we have? So we have um, these black and white videos, each one corresponding to a baseline interval. So that's our data. That's our um, what I will call from now on experiments. 
And with these black and white videos, we can now characterize the dynamics of the system by computing uh, what we call the surface activity signal, which is simply defined as the number of active pixels at a given time, t or a given time, a given frame, uh, divided by the total number of pixels. The signals obtained from the experimental videos look like this, as you can see here in this slide. And as you can see, all of them are characterized by intervals of low activity, followed by spikes that represent or stand for the waves that propagate across the large areas of the pond. This looks very similar to what neuroscientists have reported uh, as the activity in neural systems, as has been stated before. And, and just a, for a qualitative comparison, um, I'm showing you here what people have reported to be the neuronal activity in vivo uh, in the brain. Um, and the signal looks um, pretty much similar to what we observe in the groups of fish, right? To characterize the frequency between spikes right, of, the, of our, our signals, we define a threshold value, which is defined um, as the temporal mean of the activity signal plus, plus two times the standard deviation or its standard deviation. And with this threshold, we can define two characteristic times, um, the interspike time, tau one, which is the time between the beginning of two consecutive uh, waves on the surface, and the spike duration time, tau two, which is the duration of a spike. Right? Um, and the distribution of these characteristic times look like this. So both distributions, they have exponentially decaying tails and have significantly different values. This just means that the time that you need to wait to see a wave or, or a spike within the signal is much larger than the time of the spike itself. Uh, and, and this first um, analysis of the characteristic times on, in the activity signal gives us already some information on the temporal dynamics of the wave propagation on the surface of the pond. However, we want to go further and we implemented a second analysis on the empirical data aiming to characterize the spatial dynamics of the system. And for this, we extracted um, a second observable from the black and white videos, which, which, which we call the activity clusters. To compute them, we stack all the images or frames of the videos on top of each other um, over time, and identify the active pixels that are connected over space and time. And all the pixels that form a connected structure or cluster will define its volume over space and time and its area over space, right? When we computed the distributions for both quantities, the, the cluster volumes and the cluster areas, we see that they are powerly distributed with very similar exponents. This means that the sizes of the waves propagating over the surface of the water range from very small ones involving just a few individuals diving to waves involving almost all the individuals in the pond. The exponent of the power law, which is, is statistically consistent with the data at least for, um, for the small values, right, but ranges over two or three decades, results to be minus 1.5, which is the same exponent we see in the branching process with a branching ratio of one, okay? I also want to highlight here that the number of clusters um, that we can measure or obtain from the videos, it's over 1,800,000 of clusters, which is, as far as we know, unprecedented in the field of collective animal motion or collective animal behavior. Okay. Um, however, let me quickly, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, let me quickly talk about the branching process precisely because of the, of the exponent of the power law that we see here in the, in the clusters, right? <clears throat> so the, the, the branching process is uh, it's an idealization uh, of a stochastic process Oh, I mean, stochastic process, which is an idealization itself. Um, and the original purpose was to uh, model uh, population um, over generations, right? Um, in the simplest case, uh, the, the offspring uh, uh, over generations um, do not depend of, on, on the individual. It's independent, let's say, okay? The branching processes are used to model um, um, for example, as well, bacterial reproduction, right? And the rules are very simple. Uh, 
first, let's start time, let's say time t equals zero or generation zero with one single individual and at time t1 or the first, at the first generation, the initial individual produces a family of offspring of size O, right? And immediately dies. Uh, the offspring um, can vary in number, could be uh, zero, so no offspring, uh, equals one, two, and so on. Um, and at a given time, time two, or the second generation, each of the initial offspring produces its own family of offspring, and again immediately dies, which just means that each individual just lives for one unit of time, right, and so on. Uh, the small cartoon here on the right with the monkeys and with the small cute bananas uh, is, are there to represent this process, right? <clears throat> the main result of this uh, simple stochastic process is that there is a qualitative change of the population dynamics depending on the average value of the offspring number. Here I show three different cases, where on the left, the average number of offspring is smaller than one. Here, uh, so the cases divide by left, middle, and right. Here on the left, top left, is the distribution of offspring for this case. Um, in the middle, the, the average offspring is one, and on the right is larger than one. And if we plot many realization on this process and compute the number of individuals per generation or over time, uh, we would see that there are some, um, in the case of the left, almost all the realizations reach an, the absorbing point zero, because once we have zero individuals in the, in the, in the system, nothing happens anymore. Um, in the system of the right, many of the realizations diverge to very, very large numbers. Uh, in the case of the middle, some of the realizations diverge and some of them do not. And if we compute the total number of individuals in each realization and plot the distribution of it, we obtain three different qualitatively, uh, qualitatively different distributions, uh, where the one in the left, uh, sorry, in the middle, um, results to be a power law with exponent minus one. That's, that's why uh, I, I uh, talk about the disbranching process. Um, and the reason, I mean, another reason, because I'm talking about this branching process here in this slide, um, in, in this simple process is that the critical point, let, let, let's call it that, this critical point at, at one, divides two qualitatively different regimes, right? And the, um, and the associated power law has exponent minus uh, 1.5. I will show you that something very similar happens when we model the dynamics of uh, what we observe in the, in, the, in the fish system, okay? For that, um, we want to model this, right? Uh, we want to stay as close as we can to our experimental videos. So we will think the system as an array of cells where each cell represents a subset of fish, not one fish, but a subset of fish, small subset of fish, right? Inspiring the observations on the field, each cell can add up one of three different states, labeled as S, D, and U. S stands for the case where individuals are swimming on the surface of the water, right? which is uh, the one the individuals spend most of the time. Then D uh, is a state where uh, fish perform a collective dive, and U is a state where individuals are hovering on the water just before coming back to the surface again. The dynamics is such that the time span in states T and U is deterministic. In our model, it is like that. Uh, and once they reach the state S, the transition from state S to D is stochastic. Uh, this model is uh, motivated uh, by observations and measurements done on the field where the duration of the dives of, of fish, as you can see on the plot here on the left, um, are more or less constant over trials. However, um, on the other hand, this uh, stochastic transition between the, rates, uh, the states S and D, which is the one that triggers the diving of the, of the, the diving behavior uh, of the cells, has to account for the two main reasons of fish to dive in the absence of predator attacks, which are social contagion and interaction or fluctuations from the environment. Right? So we want to account for both. Thus, the rate consists um, the, the functional form of the rate consists of two terms, one interaction term controlled one by one parameter that I call A, um, and one spontaneous term um, controlled by a uh, parameter omega. I, I don't want to go into the details, but um, the most important part to say is that A controls the social interaction and omega, the, the fluctuations coming from the environment, okay? 
the parameter a, um, well, this is again, I will explain the same using a cartoon, right? Uh, uh, again, the A quantifies social interaction. Uh, in, in our model, each cell interacts with um, the eight nearest neighbors, um, as you can see here on, on, the, on the left. Um, and depending on the number of neighbors in the diving state, right, a focal cell can make the transition to state D, S to D. And the parameter o, omega quantifies the random influence from the surroundings um, and is the, the one responsible for the spontaneous transitions from state S to D without taking into account the surroundings. Again, without not going into the details the, or technical details, we can fit the parameters A and omega um, to the values A star and omega star that fit best the experimental observations. And as you can see here in this com comparison, um, we recover not only the activity signal qualitatively here on, on top, right? Um, but also the distributions of the characteristic times as well as the cluster distributions. However, the interesting part is to see what happens when we vary the parameters A and omega around our star parameters, A star and omega star. First, let me show you what happens when we fix omega, which is again the spontaneous parameter. Um, and here we show you five different videos of the simulations uh, where white pixels are the active pixels or the ones that are in the diving state. As you can see here, when I start the videos, uh, for small values of A here, the dynamics is quite chaotic. And by chaotic, I mean that there are many active uh, pixels that trigger neighboring cells quite easily. On the other hand, for large values of A, very few pixels turn active. And in the middle, uh, there were uh, we see pixels activate, activating neighbors, but resemble more the waves that we observe in experimental videos. Thus, it results that the parameters that fit best the experimental data, which is uh, the, the blue case here in the middle, um, they are uh, in the edge, right? Between a continuous or self-sustained activity and a low activity, which immediately remembers us the branching process. That's why I, I try to explain it to you as best as I could. In that sense, it is, um, this is a first numerical suggestion that the simulation that does fit the experimental observations are located close to a critical point or more correctly stated to a pseudo critical point. And I say this because of the, as you, you can imagine that we have a finite size um, of the system, right? Now let me show you how do the corresponding activity signals look like for all the five cases I showed you before. Here I show you the five activity signals corresponding to each of the previous videos. Again, um, there's a clear division between extremes. Low values of A show high activity compared to high values of A. And the signal close to the sort of critical point shows the spikes of activity that we saw as well in the experiments. <clears throat> when um, I compute dynamics for different points in the complete parameter space defined by A and omega, and not just a, as I showed you before, we notice again a qualitative difference of the dynamics to the left and to the right of the pseudo-critical regime. In the plot, the orange star um, are the parameters that fit best the, experiment, the experiments. As you can see in this video, the dynamics of points A and B is more uh, chaotic again, uh, as opposed to dynamics on points C and D, where only a very, very few pixels uh, turn white. Looking closer to dynamics in E, which is the special regime or, or, or critical, pseudo-critical regime, we can see that there, the spontaneous uh, transition, they managed to propagate over several neighboring cells. Right? Um, but now you might ask, now, what happens to the cluster distributions, right? I showed you already what happens to the activity signals in some sense, but that, what about the, the cluster distributions and what, I, what it happens is something very similar. And what I plot you here are two heat maps where I plot something that I call p-value, right? Um, that is calculated um, or obtained after running simulations for each set of parameter a, uh, parameters a and omega. Um, after this, after running simulations, we compute the activity clusters, right, for, for each set of parameters. And then we test the resulting distributions of these activity clusters um, to see if they are statistically consistent with powerless. 
right? And according to the test uh, that we use, uh, the p-value is close to one um, in the case where the data are consistent with a power law. And again, as you can see in this analysis, it shows that only in the pseudo-critical regime uh, we can find these power laws uh, in terms of the cluster areas and the cluster volumes. Uh, and again, in this plot, you can imagine that this orange cross stands for the experiments that fit the experiments best. Right? Um, to obtain even more evidence that were um, within the experiments, so that the parameters associated with experiments are located in a pseudo-critical regime, we computed as well the correlation of the fluctuations, and as follows. Right? The, the, the algorithm is going to be as follows. Um, if we represent the dynamics of, the, of each cell, of a given cell, by, uh, by using a variable called Q, I, J, T, where I and J stand for the position of the, of the cell within the system, because this is a two-dimensional system, um, and T is time, it, within a system of size L by L, then we can calculate the average um, activity or the average value of this, this variable Q um, by uh, summing the values of Q over time. And then we can compute the correlation of the fluctuations, right, um, at a given time t by, uh, yeah, by calculating this quantity here. Um, and you can notice that this quantity depends uh, on the values of the parameters a and omega, right? That's why I, I say the correlation at a given time t given a and omega as parameters. Um, and this will give you uh, us a signal, right? Um, and then we can compute for each set of parameters a and omega the average correlation over time as well to, to obtain a, a real number. If, if I do that, I, uh, I, can, I, I will obtain always a real number for each set of uh, parameters a and omega, and I can plot them again in this parameter space and compare them. And you can see that, uh, again, we see a, a spike or an increase in the correlation of the fluctuations uh, very close or at the pseudo-critical region, right? Uh, and, and if I plot just a cut here at a constant omega, uh, this, this is the curve that, that you would observe in this, in this surface, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, I've shown you evidence uh, in terms of activity signal, as well as activity clusters, um, and even in terms of the correlation, that the experiments are very close or operate very close to the pseudo-critical regime. Um, but you might have a very natural question, um, which is, and so what, right? Um, what does criticality signify in this biological context? Um, and to understand the functionality of criticality in our system, let's just remember uh, my definition or the definition I gave you about the what is baseline activity or what we are studying here. And I define baseline as the intervals in time where no evident perturbation was observed, right? So we, we left bird attacks out and, and other uh, perturbations that we could see by eye. However, we, we, uh, we know that there are still some information from the environment flowing into the system, right? This information might be labeled as noise, if you want, and it can be, for example, some wind blowing uh, close to the pond, or a branch of a, of a tree breaking close by, or even acoustic or visual stimuli um, that we didn't perceive when recording the videos, right? Um, and this could be the stimuli that trigger the activity waves that we see in the system. Um, and if that's, if that's like that, we can ask ourselves, does criticality confer the system some benefits related to the external stimuli? Or more concretely, if we could order the intensity of the stimuli in an increasing order, as I'm doing here uh, in this ideal, idealized plot here, where in the x-axis I have the, the, the stimulus ordered by what I call level of danger, right? Um, then what is the effect on the system? Or what is the, the, the effect on the individuals? Is there an effect at all? For example, you can imagine that the effect could be increasing, right? Or there could be no effect at all, which would be the pink case. Yeah. <clears throat> and to test this, 
we performed some numerical simulations again uh, with the model where we perturb the system with a given intensity i. Uh, this intensity goes from one single perturbed cell until nine perturbed cells. What we do is basically at a given time tau p, tp, sorry, which is the time of the perturbation, we activate by hand the, the given number of cells um, instantly and then we just leave the system evolve over time without making any other perturbation. After the perturbation, we selected a randomly um, a, a random cell, right, uh, close to the perturbation here depicted in pink, right. So here we, we implemented perturbation in the in the black region in this in this cartoon here, um, and then we select uh, a close by re uh, region depicted in pink, and we select just one random cell there. We computed the, the time where the randomly selected cell was active or again in the time state, state within, a, within the given time window t, right? So what I would do is I, uh, I, I uh, select my, randomly, my random cell at time of the perturbation and then I just compute the time ta, ta where this cell was um, in the timing cell or active compared to the time window. So these quantities uh, lies between zero and one, right? Uh, and we compute this quantity for several realizations where each time we select a different cell. Right? Um, and, we, um, and at the end of having, um, doing many realizations, we um, uh, average of the realizations and we can obtain a, a, an average value of this ratio. And of course, you can imagine that this value depends on the parameters of the, of the model, right? Um, and for parameters, so what comes out of this um, is that for parameters outside of the pseudo critical regime, right, uh, the perturbation of different intensities have the same effect on the system. So, for example, here in the case on the left, which would be cases, uh, this is a co at constant omega, all of the, all of the three. Um, so, if A is smaller than the, the critical value of A, then it doesn't matter if I perturb the system with one, nine, nine, or even no perturbation at all, the, the, the ratio of the active uh, time uh, is going to be the same. Uh, sim something similar happens for larger values of A uh, outside in the subcritical regime. And you can see that in the critical case, um, there is an effect uh, not usable by I, right? Um, and if I naively compute the best linear fit, which would be the, the red curve here or the red line here, um, maybe this helps me to, uh, to, to compare the, all the three regimes uh, between each other. Um, and that's why uh, basically what I did, what I did was I computed, so I ran simulations for each of the parameters now in the complete parameter space and defined by a and omega and I compute and I'm plotting here just the slope of the fits and again um, just in this in the in the pseudo critical regime um, is where the slope is the largest right um, I want to highlight that in in in, uh, in this case we can interpret this sensitivity to external perturbations as a benefit to individuals if we believe that the time that individuals dive is directly correlated to the energy that individuals invest, which is close to the question uh, that was asked uh, in the previous talks, right? Um, talking about um, how, how um, yeah, I mean, investing energy, how, how this is affected or how can this help to quantify benefits in collective um, behavior in animal systems. Um, but this statement, which is based purely at or until the, 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 in, the pre, in the two previous slides uh, I, I showed it, which was based purely on numerical simulations um, and just our minimal or simple model, seems to be very close to reality because some members of our group um, performed some experiments in the lab using the same sophomolis where um, they exposed the individuals to different external stimuli. In this case, a visual stimulus and an acoustic one 
and the sum of both. So here in the cartoon on the left, you can see that the, a small group of individuals uh, was put in a tank and the, the, they, they provided visual stimulus um, from the top as well as an acoustic stimulus and also the sum of both. And they uh, define what a full dive was, they define what an initial st uh, fast start was as well, they, they measure the, the, the depth of the, of, the, of the dive, right? And they did it by computing, using the tracking of individuals um, in, this, in this system. Um, they noticed that the different stimuli, stimuli um, had different effects uh, on, for example, the responsiveness to the cue, right, which is here on the left, which just quantifies the percentage of individuals of the group that responded right, to, the, to the stimulus. You can see that the, the clear, the, there's a clear difference between acoustic and visual, uh, because acoustic, at least in this case, seems to be uh, less effective to scare the individual. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, they also uh, measure the, the fast start depth, right? Um, in which case the bimodal uh, stimulus uh, seems to uh, make the individuals dive deeper and also dive longer in this case because this would be the fast start duration. Um, and with that, I would close and, and use this summary uh, slide because this is a long summary slide because um, in this talk, at least, I try to show you a detailed characterization or study of empirical observations, right, in, in, in the case of the, of the fish, where we can see, with a, even without putting a model on top, we can see already different suggestions that this uh, behavior is is quite singular because we can see separation of time scales in terms of the activity signals as I showed you at the beginning. But as well, we can see uh, power law distributed observables um, in the case of the cluster uh, volumes and areas, right? Where the exponent is minus 1.5 and, and that's why it motivated the whole branching process slide um, in terms to say uh, that, the, that the behavior is similar to what people have observed in a, again, a simple, simple model uh, or process. Um, and that this system, uh, the, 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 the fish system, um, is quite noise driven. So noise plays an important role. Um, and that, again, was the whole, the whole topic of the talk, right? Um, however, I want to say that this, um, and I should say it before, but I want to repeat it again, um, the data that we can we can obtain from the from our videos um, is unprecedented. We have too much data, right, to to assess our statements that quantify the spread of information of, of within the group. And one of the main reasons that we could do that is because we avoid tracking of individuals, which is what many or the vast majority of um, analysis of um, of animal motion or collective motion in animal groups do. Uh, tracking individuals is hard task to do still today, although there are many, many uh, steps forward trying to, uh, to make this um, easier, but uh, yeah, definitely it is, it is, it is hard to do. Um, I want also to say that we, um, even just using, right, a minimal and simple uh, model, we can recover the phenomenology that we observe in the experiments. Um, and we can, and using this, this, this model, right, we can, we, we can, uh, there is suggestion, numerical suggestion that the, the real life system operates in this in pseudo critical regime or region, um, where we can, we can see that the correlation of the fluctuations um, peak or reach a maximum in that, in that region, um, as well as the, we, can, we can test that the, the system is sens sensible, sen I don't remember, one is related to feelings, one is related to how you perceive, I mean sensitivity is, uh, is present in the system, the system can recognize how, how intense you, you, you the, 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 the external flow of information is, 
as well as we recover the powerless as well, right? However, one of the, for me at least, the nicest features of this kind of studies is that all these results that comes from, of course, they are inspired by very classical textbook physics, right? Um, in this case, they might be interpreted in a biological context, right? Because talking about spins and, and, and so on, um, it's very nice and then definitely something good to do. But here we can say if there is a functionality in, in, in if, if the system uh, wor uh, works in, at criticality. Um, and, and again, so, so, so we have empirical evidence as well that at least the, sens the sensitivity to external perturbation happens in the sulfur models. Um, this is, as far as we, as, we, as we know, one of the first experimental studies that show that a macroscopical biological system operates near criticality for long times um, and for systems uh, as large as the one we are using. Of course, people have done this in different systems, in, in flocks of birds. Um, however, the, the data they, they were able to, to get, you can imagine, as limited to, to a reduced as a group size, as well as reduced time windows. And here we overcame that uh, the restriction by, and the, the price we, we paid is basically, we didn't model individuals, we modeled subsets of individuals that and the propagation of information on the surface, right? I didn't show you any equations of motion as um, uh, as in the talk before, but of course, uh, that that's that's definitely the price to the, the price to pay. Um, however, in this particular system, what I, for me at least is the most uh, interesting question to ask is um, why can we see so easily, so easily, put it like that, that uh, the system operates in a criticality, right? Because maybe it is the pressure um, that the individuals are facing almost constantly that drives the whole system to criticality. And, and by pressure, I mean, um, you can imagine individuals being um, uh, constrained to the surface due to the lack of oxygen, so you have some kind of pressure, some kind of geometrical pressure, right, that pushes the whole system to the surface. But as well, you have the the, the risk of being eaten on the on the on the top by by predators, um, which probably, I mean, of course, this is of course hand waving and, and something um, that comes out of this kind of analysis. But I think it's the most interesting questions to me, and also the hardest questions to me as well. Um, but however, maybe, maybe it's precisely this pressure that allows us to, to, to um, get some, uh, get the critical properties of the system easily. Because, of course, groups of animals are facing threats all the time, right? And, 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 but maybe if you don't constrain them so much in space, right, um, that doesn't happen that evident. Or, or it's harder to get into that. That's what I want to say. But yeah, so that that that's my my uh, my five minutes of hand waving, I guess. Um, and yeah, so uh, and of course this work is, is is done with the help of many many members of the of um, the science of intelligence cluster as well as, as the the Humboldt uh, groups that we collaborate with. And yeah, I, I thank you so much for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you. Any question? If nobody starts, may, may I start with my? Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I joined my thanks. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I tell you what we did recently and uh, what resembles me uh, some moments of your talk. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some time ago, our group was involved uh, to analysis of, uh, of human dynamics. And we collaborated with a group of Stefan Turna from Medical University of Vienna. And what we studied, it was behavior of people during so-called massive multiplayer online game. Okay. We have records about people playing during several years with resolution one second, and there were thousands and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so we were looking for different observables. And beneath them was one which also was analyzed in your talk, was so-called waiting time distribution. So in this game, people are shooting, people are buying, people are uh, making friends. Uh, it is analogy of economical activity, very different types of activities. And then indeed, for some types of activities, we found exponential decay. There is for some type of activities, we, ha we found power loss. Then again, uh, we found so-called so -called, um, circadian behavior. You know, people at night behave different and as a day. I, I assume also fishes at night do something Definitely. different as a day. And probably if you increase the, the observation window, in your case, you will also observe this. Uh, but uh, what I want, first thing, I want to ask you whether there are some other types of activities, some possible types yes, of ob activities which can be observed in your case, except of being on the surface, diving, and of this three state model. Yeah? That's one thing. And the second thing, what I know, and what we studied also, it's known that human dynamics is burst very bursty. So people sleep, sleep, then do something, then again do nothing. And there is the observable, which is named burstiness. So one can calculate this burstiness. And then what we did, we compared this burstiness of people living in, uh, on, in this internet game, this burstiness of people doing uh, uh, money transfers, this burstiness of people, uh, you know, take, taking books from libraries and so on. Probably for your processes, Definitely, for your processes, you can calculate this burstiness and compare it, say, between different species of fishes, for example, or between fishes and, and you mentioned that there are different observations. Yeah. So, two, two questions. The first one is about do you have different types of activities in your observables? And second, uh, did, are you aware about somebody study, studying burstiness of these processes? Thank, thank you for the questions. Um, and in the in the case of the fish, I think they are both related. And let me explain you the whole story, right, of, of how individuals uh, behave across one or many days. That's basically what you're saying when we um, when we would increase, right, the, the time window. Um, and in fact, uh, what I showed you here is not a let's say a behavior you would observe, observe all the time. It would be very probably costly for individuals. What um, what you would do, what you would see is that um, across one day um, and at a given times that I'm not sure, probably in the mornings and the afternoons, um, the, the, the fish show this critical behavior. But uh, for example, you can imagine if it rains or if the, somehow the oxygen level within the, the, the water increases, then fish would tend to go down. So this would be a different, let's say, behavior that the, the, as, as you would, uh, as you asked. So there are different behaviors that we don't account here, but somehow the system always manages to come back to the system. So somehow um, this, instead of just being um, some kind of pseudo criticality, it's rather um, self-organized criticality, right? So because mm -hmm. somehow the system goes to through many different um, let's say states, if you would call it that. Um, but somehow the system always manages to come back and back and every day, at least once or twice a day, go, go back into this, this BM, to, to, the, to the dynamics I just showed you in detail, right? So this is not the whole, the fish does, do not behave like that all the time. It's rather by intervals, or by, by long intervals, I would say. Um, but this is like that. In terms of the second question of uh, the burstiness, to be honest, I have, I've never heard about this, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 of course, I would glad I would be glad to to test um, or to measure that quantity within within the system. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot. Yeah, I I didn't know this quantity, but maybe yeah, you uh, can you can do it almost for free. Once you have distribution and you have first moment and second moment, it comes automatically. I send you the reference. That's, oh, that would be that would be great. Thank you. That would okay, be great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Any other question? Uh, yes, I would like to to, to ask. Uh -huh. Okay, if, if it possible. Uh, so I would like to thank for a nice uh, report uh, and uh, nice results. That the main conclusion is that 
as far as I understand that uh, the self, uh, that the pseudo-critical regime is uh, the most optimal in, in, and gives the, the best condition uh, in the, uh, if some kind of uh, dangerous cases. Yes, but example, uh, yes. I think the main question uh, appear after that, that what is the, uh, in fact, mechanism which, which uh, allows the fish system to, to support, to organize su such kind of pseudo-critical regime? Do you have some idea? So, so in terms of the, um, uh, so that question is, is a good, good question in terms of what mechanisms, so, so the question is, what allows the fish or the individuals um, to sustain this activity? That's what you say, right? Um, yes, yes. In terms of this model, um, I think that question cannot be answered, at least as far as I understand, because um, this model somehow is, um, so once you provide the parameters, right, you would observe a given dynamics, either critical, subcritical, or supercritical. So it, 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 it will not go away from there because, because the model is like that. However, and maybe if we include the probability of of, um, of of making small variations, right, around a given set of parameters, then maybe we can explore um, what would happen. Um, but at the moment, I, I don't think I can answer that. Um, and it goes in the same direction as what I said before, right, in terms of um, in the real-life system somehow makes the, the fish come back again uh, to this critical uh, dynamics and then for some time be there. Um, and the question you ask is very valid and very um, definitely biologically oriented. Uh, but I, at least I don't have a clear question right now. Um, because what, I mean, you can imagine that we, we, what we did is just basically model where, where, where just kept the, the videos of that particular dynamics and study that. And now probably the second step to do is, is what you suggest. Um, but it's definitely interesting. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I don't know. So maybe a brief comment from my side on this. Um, yeah. because I've been several times to Mexico to the field, so I, I have more knowledge that it's not contained in the data itself. Yeah. So we have actually some ideas what the mechanism are, how fish could tune their distance from criticality. Uh, and, and one mechanism actually related to Vinny's talk, which is actually the density. So they can modulate the distance to others. And by getting more denser, they would get more critical or closer to criticality. And by getting less dense, they actually disrupt the propagation of signals and it becomes less critical. So density seems to be a really crucial parameter. Uh, this we cannot observe from the video data that, uh, that um, Lewis showed. For this, we actually had experiments planned where we put underwater cameras where we can track the density distribution essentially to see how many fish are there actually. And how does it change over time? Um, but you we, think that uh, fish has some special uh, instrument to control the density around uh, each person? So they, they, they can, by, by, by vision, they can just uh, determine how many agents they see, how many neighbors they see in the vicinity. And I think they can control whether they feel comfortable with few neighbors or whether they're comfortable with high neighbors. And by this, regulate through their own behavior, the density of the fish school. Uh, do they have some sensors which may uh, count pressure? Because actually you are, have uh, strong uh, hydrodynamic interactions, which are long range and by excess pressure or something, they may control where it is less, more. So, yeah, so it's, it's a good idea, I think. So this is an excellent question. So um, in fact, we know because there's a stream system as well, so we have actually pretty strong flows. And you know, strong flows are rather different from resting water. And we know, for example, that they order very much, not because they necessarily want to align with themselves, but because they want to stay in one place, so they uh, just swim against the, the stream. Uh, measuring pressure, I think, I'm not sure that, you know, we, we don't have this. I think it would be interesting maybe to think about measuring uh, pressure differences and gradients and so on, because it is known that fish can detect this through specialized organs. Um, however, I'm also a bit cautious because it might be very hard to do this in a real field system. So we have to imagine, you know, these are, it's a non-laboratory environment, it's a very wide stream, 
Uh, so there are permanent perturbations and, and uh, fish move also around, so they don't stay in one place. So they can, they, they can be in one place, but they move to a different place in a stream. So you would have to somehow follow them with your sensor if you want to really measure the pressure of their positions. Um, and it might be very noisy as well. So, um, and I'm not sure that we can get the right sensitivity to, to uh, get some conclusive information on this. It can be also um, uh, fluctuations, uh, uh, turbulence in the water, uh, food availability, uh, oxygen saturation, and some other factors. For sure, for sure. I mean, yes, in even life. I mean, uh, as, uh, as was said before, I mean, day and night, they don't behave the same. I mean, definitely. I mean, you can imagine this is a system which is very, very complex. And what I showed you here is was basically putting as much complexity complexity apart as we could without leaving the some complexity within the system, yeah. right? Um, uh, definitely. I mean, I mean, I mean that that's that's the kind of questions we always have to face because definitely um, these kind of systems we have to account for for all of this. But um, but it, it's hard and uh, there's a balance, right, between trying to be minimalistic in terms of models. So you would always try to, in the physics of uh, the physicist kind of way, trying to simplify as much as possible, but it's true that when you are using real life systems, then, then yeah, you, you have to account for both, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's definitely valid, all the questions, but uh, uh, also hard to address, I guess. Um, but yeah. May I ask another question, please, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, certainly. Yes. Thank please you. Yes, I am Larissa Brzezik from Kiev. Uh, thank you very much for interesting lectures uh, all these three days. But regarding uh, the two-day uh, lectures, uh, two-day lectures, I have a question. Um, maybe it's not relevant for fish, but for uh, many animals, uh, their dynamical behavior is different. Uh, reaction to stress. Uh, some individuals get scared, getting scared, become more active, trying to show their aggressiveness. Some others, on the contrary, become so much scared that they are paralyzed. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you also, do you know uh, if this is the case with fish or birds? Well, with birds, but yes. But what you let, let me just rephrase what you say, and that uh, the question is rather regarding heterogeneity, right, in the in the dynamics or the behavior of individuals within one same group, right? And and yeah. I, I can tell you that this question is as as important that and interesting that we are working at the moment with with a with a student with Linda on on, on how this heterogeneity uh, in the movement of individuals affects the, the, the group and there is experimental evidence uh, definitely at least in, in, in lab experiments um, and this e even just um, thinking about uh, individuals having different preferred speeds that already gives you so much um, impact on the group dynamics that can be quantified by the shape of the group for example if the heterogeneity is, is, is large I think the, the groups would tend to be like a, like an elongated elongated shape. If the heterogeneity is small, then it's rather circular. It definitely, it's a field that people and at least us we are definitely interested, and that happens in fish for sure. And I would even say in 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 many species. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely a very interesting and valid question, and we definitely address this uh, in the group. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so any other question? Okay, let us thank once again all the speakers of today's session. And uh, we finish.